Hi, my name is Roy Collin and welcome to the show. I've also got five podcasts, The Awakening Podcast, Exposing Fraud and Corruption but with Solutions, The Crypto Podcast, Talking About All Things Blockchain, NFTs, Crypto, The Meditation Podcast, Talking About All Different Types of Meditation, but there's also meditations there from one minute to two hours. And the other one is the Learn Polish Podcast, so if you're interested in learning Polish, you can do that. And the other one is speaking with Roy Collin, and I just have guests from around the world talking about either public speaking or also about their book or just general life in general. And you'll find everything on bio.link forward slash podcaster. I'm also a podcasting coach. And you see the QR code there, and it's also on my link as well. And if you're interested in actually going on some podcast shows, I'm helping people doing that. Or if you're interested in sponsorship, you can contact me. And I'd like to thank my sponsor, DanielPacker.com. He helps people with anxiety, stress, and addictions. He's got a 90% success rate, and you only pay if you're successful. So be sure to check him out, DanielPacker.com. I hope you enjoy this week's show. Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. Guest today, he's the CEO, co-founder of The Uncommon League. He's also the author of three books. Please welcome Paul Crosby. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for uh, coming on the show. So, I mean, I mean, I've kind of just hit on the author and your company, but you might just kind of let the listeners know a, bit, a little bit more about Paul. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, Paul Crosby, I am uh, currently a, a CEO of uh, the Uncommon League. Uh, we're a training company. We provide uh, a lot of training for product management, uh, business analysis, uh, project management as well. Um, critical thinking and conflict management uh, topics are, are those near and dear to our heart. Um, we are a niche company. We've been here in uh, around North America for quite a while. This is our um, happy eight years in business. Um, and we've just uh, started to expand a little bit into Europe, which is awesome news. So we had a great uh, trip recently to Brussels, which I enjoyed. Uh, nice town. Um, and of course, our, our happy little friends in Amsterdam. So we were like super excited about that. Um, and we've been kind of getting some some good stuff going. So we're um, really uh, just kind of kicking things off and getting going for, for next year. And it's uh, great being here. I appreciate it. Yeah, problem. So I suppose like, I mean, like you do the project management and I've got the PMP. I think I done that. I think it was 99 and then you have to get the continuous points because I've just saw some of the videos. Some of the stuff that you do uh, actually allows for the points on different kind of education systems. Yeah. Oh, yeah, all the continuing education credits that you can get, um, the PDUs and all that fun stuff. Yeah, we help you provide those as well so with all of our different courses. Um, you know, and, and we present at conferences as well. So if you, you're at a conference and all that kind of good stuff, um, you can certainly earn a lot of PDUs for your recertification there. I, I formerly a PMP, I, I kind of let mine go um, because I was refocusing on more of the business management side of it, leadership um, in in that sort of sector. Um, As we kind of moved forward in the organization and I kind of grew with it, uh, just kind of starting off as in the contributor role and then building up to um, CFO and then now CEO. Um, So I just kind of felt that the PMP just didn't quite fit for me uh, from, from that perspective. But yeah, Scrum Master certification, same thing. I've got that one. I've got... I've just got certifications all over the place. <laughs> and just on the like the project management, because to be honest, which I think a lot of these things, it's not that the information that you're being taught is good, but a lot of times, like the mag, like especially for the project management thing, I never felt the magazine was any good. So then I was just kind of renewing it. And then you had to do the three years, get 60 points. And it was like, you're doing it. I was running project building apartments and everything. And I was like, it was a chore to go in and start updating stuff. I don't think the system is brilliant for the individual. It's actually like, yeah, granted you get the initials after your name, but it. I, I thought at one stage, this is helping me, but then I kind of went, why am I doing this? I'm just yeah, curious I, your own thoughts on that one. Yeah, you know, I wasn't an, an active project manager, right? I, I wasn't doing that. I was doing more of organizational leadership. But if you, I mean, if you're doing project management work and that's what you're doing every day, yeah, you, you got a great career and I loved my career in project management. I did it for 20 years. 
and I always had the certification when I was when I was an active project manager. I felt that it was it did kind of differentiate me and and show that I was committed to my craft and that I wanted to succeed um, in the project management space. So I, I felt that the, the credential for me was, was an important part to have. Um, it, it just kind of depends on you know who you are and in your career and kind of where you want to go, uh, whether that credential will be of, of benefit to you or not. And like with the, currently the Rugby World Cup is on and I know that you, you know, you're kind of breaking into Europe. So rugby, you know, you've got a Jer American football, but like rugby is big in Europe and like they go for the scrum, but I don't think scrum master is the same thing. So like for those that don't <laughs> know, you might explain what scrum master is. Uh, well, I, I prefer the term scrum leader myself because uh, that's kind of where I, I see that role. Uh, scrum master is that scrum leader, the person that is leading a development team to a complete a sprint, right? And help them be efficient in their processes, effectively working through things. Um, kind of making sure that everyone is is on the same page with what the you know the working agreement is, so everybody sort of understands the process of what's kind of going on. Also, I I kind of see it as a, as a little bit more of a an active role. I see it as a role of um, you know when you're at the scrum of scrums, when you have all of the the scrum leaders together and it's coordinating amongst all of the different scrum teams within an organization. Um, looking for best practices, um, trying to figure out process improvement, being more efficient. Um, you know, you're doing the measurements of metrics and all that kind of thing. And I think some organizations sort of see the scrum master or scrum leader as kind of not as a direct role. It's sort of a, a passive role of kind of, yeah, you're just kind of off to the side coaching and and, and all that kind of thing. I, I see it more as an active role, an active role of continuously improving that process for that team. Um, and it's also making it practical and realistic for the team. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that I've often coached on all of my agile transformation clients is, you know, listen, there's the, the standard approach. Great. It's awesome. And it's good to know that but we all have different teams. We all have different needs. We all have different teams. And it's okay to kind of tweak that process a little bit to make it work. Make it practical. Make it something pragmatic that you're going to be able to utilize in order to deliver your software, your hardware, whatever it is you're delivering in a more effective and timely manner. It's just, uh, I apologize for the binging. I didn't realize it was me. I just forgot to put it on silent. So I apologize yeah, no. for that. So I see that you've got over 90, 90 courses. And then there's like for the individual or for the corporations, you know, the companies. And when it's the companies, is it that you're getting them to do it individually or you're trying to get them as a group? What way is it typically done? Uh, the way that we do it is we first come in and, and then you'll engage us and then we'll, we'll have an assessment. We'll just talk about kind of what is that you're trying to get out of training? Training is kind of expensive. So we want to be able to put together a meaningful goal and a mission about, you know, what it is that you want to achieve in this training, right? Because otherwise, if you're just going out and getting generic training, there's really no value to, you know, having it in a group situation. Um, and then we, we kind of figure out what, you know, the organization, what teams, the folks that should be involved in that, kind of the targeted objectives of that, what our goal and mission is for that, that training. We customize the training to fit that goal and need. Uh, specifically so that you, you, you're getting more bang for your buck, right? We're really focusing in on the things that are important to you. And as a company, we are more focused on the practical. Um, you're not going to get a lot of theory and all of that kind of fun and exciting stuff. Theory is good, but we, we focus on practical. How do you actually take what we're telling you and bring it to life and bring it into your organization and make it meaningful uh, for your job and for the folks around you. Um, and then, you know, we sort of kind of go through that and, and we do the, the training um, and we have coaching after it. And that's a big differentiator for us too, is that, okay, you're drinking from the fire hose for a couple of days and you're getting all this stuff kind of, you know, shot at you and yeah, it's kind of sticking, but it's, it, it just kind of doesn't quite gel sometimes. And that's okay, that's perfectly natural. 
And what we do is we have coaching um, afterwards so that we've got this training, you come back again and we have the conversation like, hey guys, it's been a while. What do you think about this? We, we did this training on this topic. We did these things, kind of what, what's going on. And then we can have conversations about, you know, how do we bring it into the workplace? How do we make this real? Um, and then we just kind of mentor and coach folks on, you know, the techniques and skills that they learn in, in the class and how to bring them actually into the organization itself. And that's a challenge. It's a challenge to take that because it's a, a change, right? And the organization needs to kind of adapt to that. And that's what we're there for. We coach and mentor and help help that change happen. And are you doing that in-house or is it online? We Everybody's online these days. Um, rarely am I getting any kind of in-person kind of stuff, which is okay. It's, 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 um, we have been doing online training since 2015, 2017. Uh, so we're old hats at it, right? We've been doing it for a long time. I mean, I, as I like to say, I, we were doing virtual training before it was trendy. <laughs> Brilliant. And like, because I'm, I mean, I'm familiar with doing different courses. Not, not obviously, I haven't, you know, done, done year one, but like, sometimes there's systems to try to especially for the individual i think in companies where they kind of they're forced to do it sometimes and maybe they want to just but like have you things in place to kind of keep them interactive and they complete it because i know it's not like 10 percent complete courses I, it's supposed to be unbelievable yeah. when people buy a course whether it's you to me whether it's any of these things very few actually do it and have you anything that kind of goes hey there you go you know keep keep going well, you know, I, I think there's there's different philosophies. Our, our philosophy is edutainment, right? Because if, if you can't keep the learner engaged, then they're just, they're going to cut out, right? And I think the other thing that, that we really try to focus on is, you know, just getting your hands into it, right? Getting your mind to work on it, getting you involved in it. It's, it's not us standing at a lectern just, you know, regurgitating theory, it's like, oh no, you're going to get your hands on there. We're going to have exercises. We're actually going to do this. We're going to get into small teams. Um, we're going to, you know, use our endless whiteboard um, Miro technology, and we're going to kind of go through and, and do it and actually get the experience, the practical experience of that particular technique. And I think that's important, right? Because I mean, if, if you're just like, here's what the technique looks like, and you can read it, well, you're not getting much out of that, right? Because you're not getting that hands-on experience. With that hands-on concrete experience, you're going to learn and you're going to keep it um, and maintain that knowledge for a lot longer period of time. And it just becomes more useful for you. And that's what we kind of focus on with uh, all of our training products is to just try and move away. Is, I mean, there are points in our, like, our um, courses where, you know, you got to kind of do the lecture thing. You got to explain things a little bit. But we, we really focus on, on just making it, you know, this experience of learning and it's, it's exploration, right? And experimentation. And we even encourage that. And of course, you know, if, if, if experiment with what you've just learned, play with it, see what you, you know, check out the boundaries of it and kind of move and, and kind of shake it up a little bit. That's okay. It's, it's great. If that works better for you, yay you, that's important. Um, we're all unique human beings. We're all unique organizations. And so being able to be flexible and adaptable and taking the, the techniques and skills that we give you and, and kind of changing them up a little bit to work better for your situation is awesome. That's exactly what we want you to do. Um, and so we, we're really passionate about making the experience for the learner just this engaging thing and that, that it's high energy. And uh, I think that that is a sort of focus that we've always had. And, and we don't have this necessarily the, 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 what I call the news anchor polish. Right. And, and I don't, and I don't want that for my instructors. I want my instructors to be real. I want them to, you know, you walk the walk and you talk the talk. Right. So our instructors actually do these jobs and they are out on consulting gigs and, and they're current in the industry and they get it and they've been doing it for for a long period of time and they make excellent instructors. I, I really wanna have more of that going on. I don't wanna have somebody, you know, sort of looking like Walter Cronkite or Dan Rather or, or you know, uh, 
whoever the speaker of the, you know, like a newscaster. I don't want that. I, I want somebody who's like in there engaging and exciting and, and kind of pushing you along and encouraging you and, and giving you this energy to learn and, and to really work through uh, the, this, the whole course that we're kind of putting together for you. It sounds a million times better because to be honest, we've all gone through the ones where we're just kind of falling asleep and nobody wants that if it's something that's practical and you get excited. Yeah. And you mentioned, is it mirror technology? Is that what you were saying there? Uh, Miro, M-I-R-O. Miro. What, what, what exactly is that? It's an endless whiteboard. And then there's there's little components that you can drag into it, you know, like Kanban or um, uh, any kind of little component in there. And it, it allows you to draw and sticky notes and it allows multiple people to work on the same thing at the same time. Um, you can drag in documents, you can drag in pictures. Um, you can just drag everything in there and just kind of play with it in different areas. And we like it. I mean, it's, it's a way of being engaging. And, and actually we use Miro on all of my um, corporate side of things. So things like our, our product backlog, our prioritization, our portfolio management, a lot of that is actually done on, on um, Miro. We just, we're, I lead a team of people that are very creative. So trying to confine creative people to a specific tool set is near impossible. It's just, you're not going to do it. It's don't try the battle. I've done it. It's just, you're not going to, you're not going to win. It's just good. It's just one of those endless battles. So what we did is we sort of created this space where folks could kind of work together and they didn't have to know how, you know, a, a big tool worked because a whiteboard is a whiteboard, right? You get your marker and you draw on it and you do your thing and, and, and there it is, right? And it allowed all of the, the teams to sort of free themselves from, from these, these tools and just get you know more toward their nature of being very creative. Um, so we, do, we run a lot of our stuff um, through there. And um, it, I found that it's, it's, a, it's a great experience. It's, it's um, really fun for the team and, and they enjoy, um, just this sort of freedom, this ability to kind of interact with it um, in, a, in a productive way. And is there a sweet spot for the numbers of people that come in or does it get too many and it just gets a bit too clustered? Do you keep it to a certain number? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, most of my teams are between six, six and eight. But, um, you know, if we're doing training, um, we we do uh, there's uh, six to eight people as well is kind of where I focus on. And so if I've got like 32 or 24 people, however, I will break them into smaller groups and then they'll have their own section of the whiteboard um, th that they can utilize and, and work themselves. So they sort of have this customized experience. Okay, very good. So with the 90 courses, what's the kind of the main ones that are, I mean, project management and the Scrum Master would be obviously up there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting a lot of uh, focus on uh, critical thinking um, as far as being able to um, understand your, you know, an individual's biases and kind of make sure that you're not uh, making decisions that are kind of not so good, right? So you're kind of challenging yourself a little bit there. I'm looking at critical thinking, understanding it a little bit deeper. Um, we, we do get a lot of things around um, techniques. We're, we're known for it as being a techniques company. Um, we, I believe we got about 320 plus techniques in our uh, inventory. Um, we have a book, um, the Uncommon Techniques book, um, that's getting a refresh here. And so we're adding a bunch of stuff into it as well. Um, so I get a lot of the techniques courses and things. But um, on the other side of it, yeah, Scrum Master is, is, is a larger issue. Uh, but there's a lot more people getting into that. Um, they like our approach. They like the more practical approach to it. They're like, yeah, we went through the, the Scrum Master training, you know, and then we got, you know, the video and we were bored to death and all that kind of stuff. And so now they're like, well, okay, great. Now, how do I take it to the next level and how do I make it work for my organization? And that's when they start taking uh, courses from us. Um, so we, we kind of focus on, on the, the, those areas, but definitely project management also, I've noticed, 
in the last couple of months has started to really gain a lot of traction. Um, I think folks are, are trying to figure out how to turn strategy into the, the tactical, right? They know that they want to achieve this goal, but then how do I get there? How do I get to that goal? Um, and so we do a lot of that work with them as well. What about AI? Because that seems to be the big thing for the last few years. And there's so many different <laughs> ones out there. And, and also embracing that in-house because some people are kind of worried about losing their jobs and just how they actually make it, you know, kind of work for them. Yeah, I, you know, it it's a tool. And I think we have to look at it as a tool. And it is a tool that has limitations, most definitely. Um, you know, it, it's, you can build a data set for it so that it can help you, you know, create and generate um, activities and kind of manage those activities. And, uh, however, I, I think what everyone's kind of ignoring a little bit is how do you build that? How do you build what the AI is actually pulling from? And, how, you know, maintaining that privacy and that security of your own uh proprietary information, right? Um, so you're not really working in a public forum anymore. Now you're working with this privatized AI model. Um, and when you look at it from that perspective, you, you need a different skill set, uh, but still very similar to an, an analyst that is looking at trying to build uh, the, the data in a way that is more geared toward the organization. It's more geared toward the world philosophy. Um, and, and the way that that organizational culture is um, and kind of focusing on, on that piece of it. So I, I kind of see it as, as less about this, you know, uber overarching monster that's going to get us all, but more I see it as a, as a tool that is going to be individualized for each organization, right? Because I can't see my organization, I, mean, I can't see any organization just throwing their proprietary data into the, the grand pool of AI in a public forum. And it's just like, hey, wait a minute, this is like useful information for my competitors. And that's that's not gonna, gonna fly, right? We're, we're not gonna do that. So I think it's more of this, this privatization piece of it. And that's a whole new skill set. But I think there is a common element of analysis that helps build these AI, privatized AIs, these uh, sort of specialized AIs that can be built. And, and you need that, that skill level. And I think critical thinking is a part of that. I think that and business analysis is a part of that. And even project management is part of that as well as to kind of how to construct it in that, in that sort of meaningful way. Excellent. So you've written uh, three books, but I think your latest one is uh, Fail Fast, Fail Safe. You might let me know what exactly is in that. Yeah, uh, that, that was my first book. And um, Fail Fast, Fail Safe um, talks about the concept of, you know, is your organization ready for failure? Are, are, and how do they view failure? Um, so we talk about in the book, like, listen, failure is a part of the learning experience. If you fail, you can learn from it, most definitely. And that, that's what we really hope for. I mean, think about it when you were trying to learn to walk. You, you fell a lot. You just didn't, you know, like pop out a mom and then just started running a marathon, right? You didn't do that. You walked a little bit. You, you definitely fell. And I'm very grateful for my parents having very thick shag carpeting uh, because that's, you know, certainly made the whole experience a lot less painful. But it, it was. It's learning how when you do that, you, you're going to fail and you're going to have those moments of doing that. But the thing about that, the failure that we have as adults is that we need to kind of focus on this fail safe, is putting ourselves in the position to fail, but also thinking about the, the outcome of it so that we can fail safely. We're not jumping out of a plane without a parachute, right? I mean, or we're not testing a parachute for the first time by jumping out of a plane. We're, we're thinking this through a little bit, thinking about the risk, thinking about, you know, all the bad stuff that kind of happen in this failure situation and not necessarily avoiding it, but looking at what would happen so that we could land softly. I think that's a big part of it. You know, I, and this, this is my story is that I, you know, decided that I wanted to, to go skiing and learn how to ski. And I never skied in my life. I've ne never had anything. So I'm like sitting on the uh, on, on the bunny hill, right? And just, we're, we haven't even gone up the hill yet. And the instructors, you know, giving us the little things that you do this and you do that and then the whole thing. And I just started sliding backwards. <laughs> 
And I just kept going backwards, you know, and I ran into this pine tree and, you know, had the great tumble and all, all this kind of good stuff. And, you know, at that particular moment, I, I obviously I failed, obviously. And, you know, I kept trying and I it just didn't go. It just didn't work. Right. And I mean, I did, I, I did, wasn't even going down the hill. I was still on a stationary flat level and I was having a, a heck of a time. Was it a good experience? Absolutely. I, I, I learned a lot about skiing and I had a great conversation with with instructors and all that kind of good stuff. So, I mean, you know, I, I got to know people and, and develop relationships Am I going to ski again? I didn't even get up the hill. <laughs> Probably not, uh, you know, but it's that experience of getting, you know, just doing it for the sake of doing it for the, for the curiosity of it. You know, I took a, a, a pottery class and dear God, I couldn't even make a flat ashtray, but I had fun learning about this and, and kind of, you know, kind of understanding how it worked and, and kind of this new exciting learning that was happening. And I and it's a, it's it's fun to put yourself into into this kind of sort of situation where you're you're not really sort of comfortable with it, but you're learning something you know new and exciting, and it just kind of going for it, and just kind of checking it out, and just you know learning the you know what would happen if I if it, if this doesn't work out, okay, no, I got some. There's no skin in the game, right? I'm not going to have to you know worry about any dire consequences, and so I, I you know encourage folks to to you know go out there and, and look at the world and, and experience new things just you know just kind of keep in mind you know where are you going to land what if this doesn't work out where are you going to go absolutely and you know you mentioned jumping out of a plane i i did that years ago and there was eight of us going to do it and they all kind of bailed two one guy went up with me and to train in the north of ireland and it was like eight hours of training and they said like two things can go wrong you know the the, the line can be twisted or the parachute doesn't open fully and oh, the yeah. guy that i went up with kind of said no i'm not doing it so i was the only person that kind of decided okay i'm i'm gonna do this because you're jumping on your own you're not tied to somebody <laughs> and i jumped out and i had both i had the twisted line and the closed parachute and like, uh -huh. yeah, first thoughts were, I'm going to die. But then I just kind of, because of the training and relaxed and just, you know, you just toggle. I even forget which way it was, but one was just hold it like that. And you kind of turn around. I think the other was you toggle it and it starts it out. And then just coming down as you land, because they had told us, pull the cords. So when I came down, I pulled it fast, thinking they never told us to do it slowly. So I went straight into the ground but because I was doing martial arts. Oh. I break rolled and I was OK, but there was a lot of people like because that didn't go up with us, just different groups that injured themselves. So I learned from that. One, I will, I'm not afraid to do that. But two is you just pull it slowly. So anytime I hear of anybody that's actually doing a parachute jump, it's the first thing I tell them, you actually pull the thing slowly as you're coming in. You know, you would think people that are trained, they're professionals, but it's just, it's life. It's not like you said, the baby falling and getting up because, and I think in business as well, so many people, I know when you get knocked, I mean, you're eight years, you said your business like that. That's very rare because most companies, you know, the, the high percentage of failure rate, even in the first year. And it's a case of like, don't let it kind of affect you. Just, OK, brush it off. What did I learn from this and move on to the next? Yeah, it, it's it's failing and adapting. Right. I mean, I, total transparency. I have had many products that have failed. We've launched them and they just and, and just dove into the ground. And, but that's okay, right? I, I think that because we had that experience of, of building it and it just didn't quite work out, we learned about it, right? And we could kind of work with that knowledge to develop new exciting products as well. Um, so, I, you know, from an, a, an entrepreneurial sort of thing, it's, you know, I, I, you know keep, keep failing in, until it, it succeeds is kind of the philosophy there. Definitely. Oh, brilliant. And just because I see some of the courses as well that they have like the questionnaires or the multiple choice and stuff like that. Like, does that work or does it kind of, you know, like they're, you're kind of showing the progress or does it kind of make people, I don't know, too anxious that they don't want to kind of progress because they're a fail of failure because some people want to be 100% right the whole time. Yeah. And, and, and you know, like the, the pop up quiz kind of thing, you know, it's like, oh. Oh my gosh, because I think that's the conditioning, right? That, you know, oh, oh my God, back to the university days where, you know, like, dear God, you know, you can't fail this test because that, that'll just screw up your major or whatever. And I, I, I think that we, we try and approach it a little bit, a little bit differently. We do a sort of a game show sort of approach. 
um, you know, where you score points and things like that, you know, and, and you use that as an opportunity to sort of learn and check your knowledge as, as opposed to thou must pass the test in order to, you know, pass the course or something like that. Just make it a little bit fun, make it a little more exciting, take the stress out of it. You know, the, the quiz is there to kind of help to make sure that we're getting the message across, you know, are we pulling the cord slowly or are we pulling it fast, right? That might have been a good question to have on a quiz. Um, and, and just kind of, you know, looking at, at it from more of an, a perspective of, of not trying to, you know, um, condemn you to the, you know, the final exam sort of experience, but giving you an opportunity to sort of learn from, from that as well. So even if you do answer the question wrong, big deal, you know, you learn from it, right? And you come back from it. And when we t to tell our students, and you know, listen, if you want to go on and do the certification piece of this, the first thing that we'll tell you is to go out, find um, uh, the exam questions, uh, the, the prep questions, whatever they are, and, and, and take the test. And you know what? The first time you take that test, it's going to be an utter and complete disaster. Just brace yourself for it. It's going to be bad. But you're going to go through and, and look at the questions that you, you didn't answer correctly and figure out what the correct answer is. And then keep studying and then take it again and do the same thing. Where did I fail? Study it again. Keep going through it. And then eventually you get to that point where you're answering all of the questions with no problems and you don't have to think about it. So that's kind of an, an approach to um, the, the quiz. I, yeah, the, the whole mandatory test you have to pass sort of thing kind of is, is not my style. And like you mentioned, kind of expanding into uh, Europe, so Brussels and Amsterdam. So is that that you're getting kind of local coaches for that or how is this working out and what other countries are you hoping to get into? Right now, um, we're we're just uh, we're developing clients, um, and those clients are virtual. So we're doing all of the coaching and training and uh, mentoring and and uh, assessments and all of that are all done uh, virtually. Um, just because of travel expenses, we have we'd have to have people come on over from North America over to Europe. That can get kind of you know transatlantic and get a little expensive there. Uh, travel in general these days is ridiculously expensive. Um, so I, I think the virtual situation is where people want to go. And we're also trying to develop people um, in in country, right? So that we have local folks um, that are um, local speakers. They're familiar with the culture a little bit more. And we're kind of developing them to sort of utilize the, some of the same methods that that we've all used. So we we built kind of America first, and then we we did North America, and you know kind of went a little bit into Brazil a little bit, went and then now we're starting to look a little bit overseas in in the European as well as as in Australia. But it, it's building those relationships with instructors, and and kind of developing those instructors into the sort of mindset that that the in common league is. Um, and and this you know more practical approach to things and kind of getting them focused on it while utilizing all of our experience right so we have instructors sit down and we have long conversations about you know our experiences and all of that kind of stuff and we learn from each other and we engage each other and we talk about um, different approaches to things so it, it's kind of building that that business and it's probably a slow way of doing it but i think it's it's the right way I, I want to have instructors, and I've often said, said this is, you know, they walk the walk and they talk, they talk the talk and they walk the walk. They've been there, they've done this, they have real experience. And that's what I'm looking for. And not real experience 20 years ago, real experience right now in today's market and today's world. And, and just being able to share that experience in a more, you know, urgent way as, as opposed to trying to you know find instructors that have, yeah they got a lot of experience in instruction but they really haven't been in the industry for 20 years so they become theoreticians and they don't really necessarily I don't even know if theoreticians is a word I just made that up and <clears throat> they don't necessarily have that practical nature about them and that's what I'm looking for we're a practical pragmatic company that's the way we teach that's the way we focus and, and that's the way we, we want to uh, bring it across to our students. Excellent. And with the, the name then, how did you come up with the, the name, The Uncommon League? Well, The Uncommon League uh, started, its name kind of came from the, the fact that we have so many 
different uh, perspectives that had come into the or to the kind of the organization. So we had three different brands, and those brands all sort of co combined into the Incomely. But we also felt that you know it's it's and you'll you'll see it on our logo. You'll see three heads coming together. In in the middle of that, you'll notice that there's a little propeller, and that propeller it's very subtle, but it's there is to propel us forward. So it's bringing in collaborating together to propel us forward is, is what that's, that's all about. And the different colors are the representations of the, the three former companies. Love that, excellent. And uh, just, just finally, because I love to know about kind of what you feel with the social media, because I, I think nobody really wants to do it, but we have to. So what do you think serves you best? I, I'm just on LinkedIn right now. Um, it's, it's kind of my focus. I, I, I just have to focus on one because it, it becomes too too crazy to try and do it all. Um, yeah, so, and people tell me I need to expand a little bit. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, right now, I focus on LinkedIn. So you can look me up on LinkedIn, Paul Crosby, I'm out there. Um, and, you know, we, we're just thinking about bringing in like a, an Instagram. We have that as well. That's the Incomely. Like we post there every now and then. Uh, Facebook, we have, we don't, we, we publish there as well. We just don't have as, as much engagement as, but, you know, we're a training company and we are dealing with professionals every day. And so the LinkedIn platform sort of lends itself to, to us as opposed to something like, you know, Twitter or, or um, threads or Instagram or something along those lines. I think a, a lot of people think they have to be everywhere, but the reality is what you're doing is LinkedIn is the best one and that's where you should put all your energy because sometimes I, I hear people going, oh, I've been doing Instagram, I got kicked off and they're, they're, get, they're upset and they're putting so much energy into something. And that, like I've realized even for the podcasting, Instagram, I mean, I have them, but I don't put out something on it because it's not served me. I don't get interactions or anything. So why put your energy into that? Put your energy where the people are there and they're connecting with you. Right. And everyone comes back and says, you know, oh, I saw you on LinkedIn. I saw you on LinkedIn. I saw you on LinkedIn. I, no one has ever come back to me and said, I saw you on Twitter. I, I think one person um, said uh, something about Instagram. Oh, yeah, I saw you on Instagram. And beyond that, you know, what? why put all my energy in, in there to try and, you know, expand that that particular platform when, I don't, you know, that platform may not be geared, geared for that. And I think that's kind of like Facebook. It's like it, it's more personal kind of, you know, family back and forth kind of stuff, less business. And I, I think that's why we don't have that much of a, a presence there. And Twitter's the same thing. It's just it's too much stuff kind of going on in there. Um, most of my folks are, are very busy professionals. They don't have time to, you know, scroll for endless updates. So, um, yeah, I think LinkedIn is a great platform and it's been working well for us. It's kind of positive as opposed to Twitter. I mean, I'm finding Twitter now as you go in and you just see negativity or there's nothing good in it. It's all bad things happen. It's like the new CNN. And it's like, you don't want to be going into that because you see something and then people are going down the rabbit hole and then they're, they're wondering why they're depressed. And I think you never see that on LinkedIn. So put your energy into LinkedIn instead of looking <laughs> at all these other things. No doom scrolling. Yes, that's for sure. Exactly. So just yeah, thanks very much, Paul. You might just mention the domain name again. And uh, yeah, and make sure I put all the links on both the audio and the video. Oh, awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah, we're at the uncommon league.com. Okay. All one word. Uh, no dashes, no hyphens, no any craziness like that. It's just all one word. Um, and check us out. Yeah, we have uh, some great stuff out there for you. No, thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much, Paul. You betcha. Thank you so much. So that's all for the Speaking Podcast. You'll find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. Until next week, take care. Well, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five-star rating, and share with your friends. And you'll find all my shows with the QR code or bio.link forward slash podcaster, as well as my podcast coaching. And I'd like to thank my sponsor, danielpacker.com, helping people with anxiety, stress, and addictions. He's got a 90% success rate, and you only pay if you're successful. Also, if you'd like to go on a podcasting tour, I can help you do that. And if you're interested in sponsorship, you can contact me on my bio.link forward slash podcaster. Until next week, take care.